Now, in terms of arguing then for the climate boundary, where the boundary is set at 350 ppm CO2, or one watt per square meter of total forcing, the argument went as follows. The first one is the realization that we may already be committed to two degrees warming, that we have evidence to suggest that we are already in a danger zone in terms of concentration of greenhouse gases. The reason why we haven't seen more than one degree is particularly the masking of air pollution, that aerosols such as sulfates and nitrates are cooling, uh, cooling the atmosphere because of reflection of solar radiation. The warming of oceans, so a large part of the buffering effect is in fact absorbed in oceans, the big thermostate on the planet, roughly half degree, and the huge ecosystem sink. And the ecosystem sink shows the interactions between these boundaries. Look here at the emissions of greenhouse gases over the past 50 years in terms of carbon. So we've increased our carbon emissions from roughly 4 billion tons to roughly 9 billion tons. And you would normally expect that it's the surface under this graph which has accumulated in the atmosphere causing warming. But as you know, this is not the case. Roughly 25% of our emissions are absorbed in oceans and another 25% are absorbed in terrestrial ecosystems. So a direct interaction between land use change boundary and freshwater use, which determines the biomass on land systems, and oceans. And the drama here is then that the gray zone under the curve here is the net contribution of stored carbon dioxide in the atmosphere causing warming. But look at the evolution. In 1960, this work from the Global Carbon Project indicates that the biosphere in oceans and lands absorbed two billion tons, and that today the contribution is four. So the ecosystems on the planet are providing a tremendous and growing free ecosystem service to humanity, not only by hiding half of our climate death, but also by increasing it over time. So it shows that the planet is operating according to resilience theory. It is trying to remain in the desired Holocene state by absorbing more and more of the negative impacts that we're causing. It's trying to stay in equilibrium. And unfortunately, just a couple of weeks back in science, Steve Runnings and colleagues from China, in fact, showed that this capacity may be coming to a lowering. Here is the first example in red of ecosystems on the planet having a reduced ability to absorb carbon. Perhaps a first sign that we cannot count forever on biospheric carbon sequestration, which again shows how tightly connected the ecosystems are to climate in terms of climate stabilization. It's so dramatic, in fact, that I think there's a scientific argument today to say that the final battleground, whether we'll be really able to stabilize climate under two degrees, is moving away from only emission cuts to the ability to be active stewards of the world's ecosystems. Now, on oceans, the situation is similarly uh, challenging and also important to realize. This is the pH curve in the world's oceans over the past 25 million years. The oceans have a very high pH at 8, and you see this very abrupt decline in pH from the industrialization onwards. So a very clear evidence that human-induced carbon dioxide emissions is causing acidification of the oceans. Very basic chemical reactions where carbon dioxide reacts with water releasing hydrogen, and then it takes out carbonates and creates carbonate acid. When it does so, it thereby undermines the ability of all marine life to build ca calcium carbonates, which is a building block for all marine life. Now, the calcium carbonate, the most sensitive one being aragonite, which we use as the control variable for oceans, is shown here. In dark green, there's a good concentration of calcium carbonate, the building blocks for marine life. In black dots, you see the coral reefs, which have, during the Holocene, not surprisingly, located themselves where there's a good access to building blocks in terms of calcium carbonate. Now, this is the situation today where we are already reducing the axis of calcium carbonate. And this is the projection to 2065 if we continue with business as usual in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Again, a coupling between the systems because what science also is indicating through work by Catherine Richardson and others at the Copenhagen University is that marine systems with high degree of biodiversity, with a high degree of resilience, have a better capacity to cope with this acidification process than systems that are undermining their biodiversity. So again, a very important agenda for active stewardship of oceans. Now, to summarize this, what does this all then mean for the climate agenda? Well, it means that climate 
policy has an even stronger justification to act quickly on climate emission cuts because it could well be proven that that might be the easier part of the larger challenge of staying within safe operating space of planetary boundaries. A very seminal work produced in Nature, also in the run-up to the COP15, based on the carbon budget approach, show that we, in fact, for the global emissions curve, may have to reach zero emissions by 2050 to be able to incorporate the new risks in terms of tipping points and to have a larger chance of staying under two degrees. If we would bend the global curve by 2015, we would have to reach zero by 2050. But if we're not able to do that and bend the curve in red here in 2020, which today seems more plausible given the low expectations in Cancun and South Africa on climate negotiations, we would have to reach zero by 2040. This is very different to a 50% reduction globally by 2050 or 80% reduction even. It changes fundamentally the agenda on what has to be achieved. And as you all know, of course, better than anyone, if you then take on the right to development in particularly developing countries, the old OECD countries that have caused the major warming so far would have to reach zero in the bracket 2020-2030 to leave room for emission increases in those countries that have rapid population growth and are most vulnerable in the current phase of human development. So this is indeed a change compared to the discussion on climate policy today. So finally then, what does this all mean? Well, I would argue that there is a good scientific case that we have entered a new phase in terms of human development. We need to now realize that we are hitting hardwired processes at the global scale, that these act together, and that they have nonlinear surprise elements in them. We also have to realize that the key elements of development is then no longer optimization. It's more about investing in our ability to persist in the Holocene. It's about transformation. It's about innovations to bend the curves, which is a new society, a new industrial revolution, a new behavioral value base. But it's also huge investments in adaptation. Because we, if we're committed to two degrees, we'll see massive changes in fresh water, sea level rise, and shifting conditions, particularly for the world's vulnerable. And it clearly shows that what we're now talking about is not only climate change in isolation. It's in fact linking global environmental change with human development and the ability to invest in resilience in terms of the ability to stay safe in the era of global change. We all want to stay in the Holocene. Thank you.